The daily grind of commuting seems like an obvious target. More than half of drivers use cars for journeys that are under two kilometers. If we could replace short car journeys with walking or cycling, we could get a lot of our daily activity without using any of our increasingly limited free time. When it seems like such an obviously healthy way to get around, why are we so reluctant to get on our bikes? I'm on the Keys in Dublin and it's just intimidating. I have a bus pulling out right in front of me here. I'm not even really sure where I'm actually supposed to go. Don't know what's beyond it, can't see anything. And now I'm about to be in a tiny narrow bit in between two buses. <laughs> okay, made it, just. Keys have made some changes, so there is little bits of segregated cycle lane, which is great, but when a car pulls right in front of me like that, not great. A few seconds later, a truck completely ignores my right of way and forces me to turn off the keys or risk getting hit. It's easy to see how most people feel very vulnerable and can be put off cycling on our roads. Cars, trucks and buses fly along with little regard. And when there are bike lanes, they're often ignored. Cyclists across the city are angry about the bike infrastructure and are taking action to demand change. Kieran, tell me a little bit about what you're doing out here today. OK, well, uh, we're from a group called iBike Dublin, and we came together about three or four months ago. And it was out of frustration, really, at the state of the cycling infrastructure in Dublin, and particularly the poor enforcement of the existing infrastructure that's here. So what we do is once or twice a week, we come out, uh, we come to one of the mandatory cycle lanes like you see here, and we line up alongside it to protect it, to stop people parking on it. Karen, why is this so important to you? It's important to me because I cycle to work every day. It's, it's, it's my chosen method of, of getting to work and it's, it's the, the quickest way I can get into work and I'd like to do so safely. I, I, I don't like that whenever, every time I leave the house my family are concerned about my safety. That shouldn't happen, you know, that shouldn't be the case when you're leaving your house to go to work in the morning. But it is unfortunately for people who choose to cycle in this city. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. Also, I, I have children, I would love them to cycle to school. I want them to, to have that opportunity as well. Uh, and I, 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 I'm frustrated that I can't, and they're frustrated that I can't let them do so. So, you know, that, that's why it's important to me personally. How can we make it better? Well, uh, making it safer is the simple way, simple way to do it. In the recent budget, there, were, there wasn't an announcement of increasing in cycling uh, funding, but it's still, I, we're not sure of the exact figures, but it seems to be at, at best just over 2% of the entire transport budget, which is minuscule, really. The, uh, the UN recommends that 20% of transport funding should be for active travel. But we're, we're just not seeing that step forward at the moment. We're seeing people talking about it, which is great, but we haven't seen the action yet. I have kids who are at school and they would love to be able to cycle, but I can't let them cycle on the, on the roads. It just wouldn't be safe. Though cyclists on average live longer and much healthier lives, most people avoid bikes because they fear the roads are too dangerous. And as we've seen, there definitely is a problem with our infrastructure. Bike lanes often end suddenly, and because they're rarely segregated, they're frequently completely ignored. It's obvious that the planning and design of our environment influences the way we get around, which then has knock-on implications for our health. Dr. Lorraine Darcy lectures at the School of Civil and Structural Engineering at DIT. She's recently completed an EPA-funded research project that looks at how the planning and infrastructure of a city affects public health. I met Lorraine in a typical new suburban town on the outskirts of County Dublin to talk about the hidden influence urban planning plays in our everyday lives. Here we have a walking and cycling path, which is a great space and we can see there's lots of people out walking their dogs, um, plenty of space and it's isolated from traffic so people feel safe from traffic. However, you'll also notice that we have quite a lot of graffiti, um, so we've tin cans, etc. here. And what they are signs of is what we call antisocial behaviour. And more often than not, we notice this, places where we're not being overlooked, where people in houses aren't looking out onto the road. So an individual walking down here or cycling down here might feel very vulnerable because they don't feel like there's somebody there if they need them. Chances are the transport engineer or traffic engineer that thought about putting in this route said this is brilliant, we can get people moving through this greenway, but the actual feel of the area and how it functions may not have been discussed. So people who are living in the new suburbs are much more likely to 
drive to work, drive home from work and um, go into their home and then have to leave again and drive to somewhere to get their physical activity. Um, whereas in our older villages, it was much more inherent in what we do. How has design changed then over the last number of decades? Is it that we just didn't know how to design well? Well, our focus changed. Before the 1940s, we designed everything for the pedestrian because people didn't have cars. And so we had our walking, cycling, public transport. And then more recently, in, from the 2000s, from, during the housing boom, we made the assumption that everybody had access to a car. So we designed what we call car architecture, where everything we've built focuses essentially on the car. And how do we go back on that? How do we get people out of the car? So we need to make nicer environment, much more comfortable environments for walking and cycling, much more connected so we can have faster trips. So what we have here is a great example of where people have burst a hole or broken a hole in a fence or a space to show us where their desire line is, where they want to travel themselves. So it's a very informal um, gap through the hedge where they can come through, walk through, and here we can see at the other side of the road they've done similar. They've taken away a bit of fence and there's a step there so that um, we can have a pathway. These two communities want to be linked, but it hasn't been designed for that, so they've done it for themselves. But then when we come down here to the end of it and we come to a roundabout, one of the most hostile environments for a pedestrian or a cyclist, really difficult to cross the road. So things were built piecemeal. They didn't link in with each other. We don't have the connectivity to move on into the next neighbourhood. So the cars are really flying off this roundabout. I mean, what I'm feeling is that if your child was cycling on ahead of you, you'd be running to catch up to stop them here. Absolutely. Or if they... If, crossing that road you need to feel like you're with them and you're shoving them along trying to move them on faster with an older person they probably feel panicked more likely to fall therefore less likely to take that trip in the first place so the nice freedom that you find on the greenway is immediately erased by this traffic filled roundabout yes it's a stressor yeah so this is an example of an environment which an engineer would probably say is quite walkable because it's got a wide footpath. You, there's a, a, a verge that separates people from the, the main traffic. It's, um, it's quite a comfortable space. It's got some street lighting, etc. But it's actually relatively hostile here. There's an individual walking, it takes a long time to walk along this road. There's not much variety, there's not much visual interest, even though there are trees. It, it's an isolated type of a walk, but it does tick the boxes for what people think we need to have. And then in relation to like our bus stops, so again, this was a traffic planning issue. In relation to have, because of the speed of the road, you need to have um, a space where the bus can pull in. But as a result, we're so far from either junction, either end of the road, that the people living in these houses actually have about a 20 minute walk to get to this bus. So by the time you get here, you could be halfway into town in your car. So this is an ex another example of how we've engineered this physical activity out and choice. So if you live there, mm -hmm. you probably still have to walk 20 minutes to get to here. here to so why would stop. you bother? So why would you bother? It's fascinating to learn how much the science of design and planning influences our health. But if this is a design issue, then there must be a way we can redesign our built environment to make active travel a part of our lives again. So is there a town in Ireland where this is happening? <laughs>